Welcome everybody. My name is Kyle Groves. I am an EIT and a senior technical specialist with ATG. I'm out of the Minnesota Bloomington Minneapolis St. Paul office and uh, today I'm really excited about our topic. Uh, We're going to be discussing designing medians using corridors in Civil 3D. And uh, toward the end of this, I'm going to show us a few ways that we can bring in some help from the CTC software corridor productivity pack to give us a boost with some of our custom subassemblies. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my video share just in case uh, that goes and gets in the way. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I do expect to take the full hour, so go ahead and get that right off the bat. But uh, again, we're just going to kind of zoom in here from the top. Why are we interested in using corridors? Why are we interested in using custom subassemblies? And then we're going to talk about what makes this specific design scenario so unique when it comes to designing with corridors. I mean, drive around any city with a population over five, ten thousand, 10,000, and you'll see a, a median in there somewhere. Uh, driving down the freeways, obviously, we've got that grassy ditch median separating us most of the time, too. But it's not exactly plug and play inside Civil 3Ds. There's a couple of things that you need to know. You can't just come in and pick your baseline slap a road and some curb on one side, median it over, and slap a road and curb on the other side. Um, or at least not the way that I'm going to set it up today, because uh, I want to kind of go reach a little bit farther than maybe the easiest scenario to help us think about how we can use these corridors a little bit more intuitively or a little bit more um, creatively is what I'm looking for. Uh, and the bulk of today, we're going to be talking about that out of the box, the link to mark point workflow. Uh, now, I do want to make a quick correction on the uh, abstract or the description and learning objectives that we had pointed out today. Um, so the subassemblies that we're going to be working with inside the quarter productivity pack technically do not automate the uh, link to mark point workflow that we're working with today. However, uh, they do have some advantages over using the automatic or sorry, over using the out of the box subassemblies. Uh, so I was uh, digging in for the prep for this one, and I realized that I misspoke just slightly on the proposal. So sorry for the for the confusion, folks. But let's go ahead and get into this. So why are we using corridors? Well, if you've joined me about once a month for the last couple of months, you've probably heard this already. So they're modular design. Uh, we take individual pieces, we slap them on, we rip them off, and we continue to do that until we get what we like. Also, they play very well with others. They play well with surfaces, feature lines, they make pretty cross sections for us. So they're a really useful tool, but they do have something of a learning curve. And why are we using custom subassemblies? Well, our out of the box subassemblies, they do a good job of communicating our design intent, but they don't always follow through with what we need for our project reporting. Uh, they don't have accurate sections. If we're trying to have layers in something like exactly what we're doing today with this link to mark point. Uh, so our cross sections don't look good. If we don't have all of the right codes or the flexibility to modify those codes, our quantity takeoff tools don't really work quite right either. So um, that's part of it. And, and why we want to use these is because we get to do things like add extra shapes. We get to customize those codes either for what goes into the software in the first place, or we can allow the user to customize that on a per project basis or per file basis. Also, um, you don't have to worry about uh, going into subassembly composer and learning all that stuff because the corridor productivity pack from CTC software is absolutely free. I'll show us how to download that at the end of the, at some point today. Um, and, you know, honestly, subassembly composer is really hard. I can take us through and, and open up one of those ones, but uh, with these subassemblies from CTC, you can actually open these up in subassembly composer and use them as a guide to create your own subassemblies, or you can come in and kind of make some of those targeted edits uh, for changing things like codes or, or modifying the user interface when you see that in Civil. So, um, let's get into today's really key design consideration, though. What makes medians so special? Well, the situation we're going to be looking at today is one where we're going to have two separate alignments, which means that we're going to have two separate profiles. Uh, we might have this situation because we're working in a steep cross slope uh, scenario. So maybe uh, going through the mountains. I got a brother out in Colorado. I'd love to go visit him, ski, Jeep, do all that stuff. But 
really interesting road design with those steep cross slopes. Another thing is that we may be adding or removing lanes as we're coming in and out of here. So as the road gets wider um, or shallower, we may need our model to kind of pick up on that and account for some of those. Also, our corridors, corridors by definition, are directional things. Um, and what that means is that a corridor is always going to build in the following way. Whatever our first station is at, we're going to have an assembly, a typical cross section that's attached to a baseline. And then from there, it's going to build perpendicular to and away from that baseline. Once it's done with this particular station, it's going to move on to the next station. And go, it always is going to work from a low station to a high station. So our directionality is, is fundamental to using these. And so what do we want, or what do we have to do then when the middle of our design needs to be variable? We just need to make that work, and we're pretty confident that the stuff on the outside of our design is going to happen. Because, uh, you know, normally you'd start from, on a simpler design, you'd have one baseline, maybe it's the center line of your road, maybe it's the, uh, the curb return line of your intersection. You just work out and you tie into something. Maybe your daylight to existing has a constant slope and a variable width, but sometimes, you know, we need to vary that slope or, and or the width between some of our known sections. And we always don't want to model that with two separate corridors. So um, in order to do that, we need to use the mark point and the link to mark point subassemblies. Now, for any of us that are unfamiliar with how these work, I'll go ahead and give us the intro, and then we'll hop into the software. So uh, what we're doing with this is effectively we have a a baseline, obviously, and we're going to build some stuff over on one side, and then we need to go connect to it. And we're going to have another set of hard-coded parameters, you know, 2% cross slopes for our lanes, uh, six-inch tall curb, whatever that might be. But it's this part in the middle that we really care about. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the subassembly marked point, and we're going to attach it to the end or to the edge of one of our sections of our known design. We're going to then use a link width and slope to go target uh, some other known quantity, like an alignment in the profile. But then as we continue to build back toward our main baseline, we need to return to that initial checkpoint. So our mark point is kind of going to be a little flag saying, hey, look at me, I'm over here. Um, and then our link to mark point is going to go start at the edge of a different known quantity and connect back to it. What this does is it allows our middle section to float. As my baseline and my secondary baseline, we can call it that, um, move toward and away from each other or up and down relative to each other, now we can just have a corridor link take these two known points and connect them. We can have a varying, low, swit, varying width and a varying slope um, in order to get those. And then uh, this one slope is going to connect those two known points. So situations today, we're obviously going to be talking about medians between curbs. However, this is really great for doing a ditch right next to a right-of-way. Maybe you can have that inside or that outside slope float. Um, and also, if you want to have your, your roadway and your ditch hard-coded or hard-designed with those specific design parameters, this is going to help you connect those without needing a second corridor. So uh, another thing, when we're using the out-of-the-box link to mark point subassembly, that's uh, this gentle subassembly right up here with the red layout mode and, and the other dot, uh, it's just a link. So there is no thickness. There is no ability to define a shape. Um, and our customization is moderate, but still somewhat limited. So we're also going to be using the corridor productivity pack from CTC to help us with that full thickness modeling. We're going to have at least one shape. Uh, or more, depending on which one of these we're going to use. Now, again, for the folks who are not familiar with using the link to mark point workflow, this will not work unless you first place your mark point. You can't really see it here in my screenshot, but it is attached to the back of my curb. That has to get put down before your link to mark point does. And again, corridors are directional, so not only do they work perpendicular to and away from the baseline, but the order in which you actually place these and attach them to your assembly, that record gets, met, gets uh, read for, as well. 
And so if a marked point does not exist, if there is no checkpoint, if there is no target that is painted, this link to marked point will never find that. So we always gotta put that down first. So enough dancing around the issue, let's go ahead and hop inside the software. Uh, as always, I am going to be keeping an eye out for questions. Feel free to throw some of those into the, um, uh, the Q&A tab or interface through the Zoom webinar software. And uh, if I can get it in the middle of my presentation, I will. Otherwise, I will also definitely be sticking around at the end for questions. So let's just kind of start out with a 10,000 foot view. What do we got here? Well, technically, uh, we could be, this full build out of this uh, would be used to design an intersection. However, we're going to ignore all that today. Um, I would be happy to do another webinar on putting together intersections uh, at some other point in time. But right now, we're just going to focus on how we can design our corridors to effectively model this median situation. So uh, our down station end is going to be to the west of this west of our subject property and we're going to move from west to east so my uh, east bound alignment that's what the one i'm going to be calling my primary alignment we're going from west to east and our station is going to increase the northern alignment that is going to be my west bound alignment um, and again technically this one is stationed from west to east because uh, we always wanted that same increasing stationing just note that traffic is going to flow from east to west in the northern half of all of this now, as we come around to this curve, um, we can see that our road starts to get a little bit wider. And now these yellow lines on the west and the cyan lines on the east, these are representing my curb geometry. So as I come around here, I can see that I'm preparing for a left turn lane for both directions of traffic, which was represented by those uh, other guidance polylines that I have it's frozen. So what we're going to do today is we're really going to focus on everything outside of my selection area. We're going to ignore the, the intersection and just talk about the curves. Now, again, why do we need to have two separate alignments? Could I just do this with one? Sure, if everything's flat, but not all situations are like that. And so the purpose of my median here is going to be twofold. One, I'm taking up space. I'm providing a barrier for people coming and going at different speeds. Um, but two is it's also going to, again, allow me to have a different elevation at these two backs of curbs so that I can have reasonable gradients um, for my vehicles to, trans to transport past. And just even kind of looking at these profiles, let me turn off my line weight. Um, you know, they look pretty similar, and I've already gone ahead and I've taken this right profile and superimposed it into my left profile view, and they're on top of each other pretty closely. There are a few areas where we're just a little higher or a little lower, so, you know, obviously I'm not trying to design across a mountain slope in the Rockies here, but I think we've got the picture. So let's go ahead. Let's get our first region uh, and our first typical cross-section put together for this area. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'll be using my eastbound lane as my primary baseline. I gotta design out, and then I gotta cross over this, this red polyline here, it's just my center line, it's my crown of my road, um, and it's gonna go uh, obviously to the north. So this one's gonna be a pretty straightforward assembly. Uh, so home, assembly, create, it is that simple. This is gonna be um, no median. Also, one of the big things I'm going to hammer on today, folks, is being deliberate with your naming of your uh, assemblies and your sub assemblies as well. Um, I'm also using a bit of a custom tool palette scenario. So in order to transfer, transfer between using the Imperial sub assemblies and the corridor productivity pack, this is just a little macro that's overriding my tool palette uh, master file location. So what I'm going to do first, we'll start out with the civil Imperial. Go find me a lane super elevation AOR, left, right, and then stay with me, but we're gonna have uh, four lane sub assemblies on the left side, and we're gonna have only one on the right of the baseline. From here, I'm gonna switch to the corridor productivity pack because all the rest of these look great. Uh, I'll show you how to get here later, but once you download the content from the CTC website, uh, you're going to get a bunch of PKT files. All you need to do to get them inside Civil 3D is simply grab that file path location 
And in your tool palette, right click on your tool palette tab, go to import subassemblies, find the ones you're interested in, just looking for PKT file and say open. Once I do that, we'll see now that I have these two Minnesota Department of Transportation ones uh, put in there together. So I'm gonna do my min.curb on the left. And then I'm also going to do my link slope to surface just outside of that. We're not gonna deal with sidewalks today. Um, and then I'm going to copy these over to mirror them over to my other side. Now, uh, you might be asking yourself, Kyle, why do we have four lanes? You just said there's only two directions to traffic over here. Well, I still need to go from my baseline. I need to go up a little bit to my center, and then I need to come down a little bit until I meet my, um, my other directions alignment. Plus, uh, you know, I'm going to get wider over here. So that's what we're going to do. My first lane, which is technically eastbound, needs to go up. So if I'm going to change my slope direction, I can do this by either changing my slope direction to or away from crown and having a positive or negative slope. This matters. I just don't know how or why. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to narrow these up to be a little bit more representative of how things are going to work in my design. So that's going to look a lot cleaner from the side. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to name all of these different subassemblies because I have to come through and do targeting in my corridor. The trick that I like to use for this is to take my, anything that's gonna have a hard coded um, or a target that I need to find, I'm gonna put that in all caps. So I'm gonna throw caps lock on, this is gonna be my eastbound lane. And then as we proceed north along my typical section, this is going to be my eastbound turn crown. That did not take. This next one from the outside is going to be my westbound turn crown. This is my westbound lane. Now, my curb's not going to target these. Uh, they're just going to happen. So this one I can just simply call a curb with no caps. From my east and westbound in, uh, and then on the outside, of course, I'm going to have my eastbound DYLT and my westbound DYLT. So now I've got a typical cross section, I've got an alignment, I've got a profile. Let's create a corridor. Uh, so we're going to call this our median corridor. We're going to go with the basic corridor style, alignment and profile, eastbound, eastbound to FG, and then we're going to use my uh, no median assembly. Go ahead and target that existing too. I don't have it turned on just because I didn't want things to get cluttered up. And the other thing, I could come in here and do my targets, but I'm going to skip this. I like to do my targeting uh, pretty much all everything I can, except for a few operations. I like to do that graphically and with my ribbon. So. Uh, I'm obviously starting just fine in the middle of my road, but we got to go through and, and get some targeting put in here. So by selecting my corridor, I'll see my contextual ribbon pop up and we can edit our targets. And now that I've gone through and named all of my subassemblies correctly, the small measure of housekeeping is going to make it so that I don't have to keep cycling in and out of this dialog box, which is, to be fair, super annoying. So my eastbound lane, uh, I'm going to be using mostly polyline targets today, by the way. Uh, my eastbound edge of lane is going to be targeting the cyan line to the south. My westbound lane will be targeting the cyan line, cyan line to the north. And then my turn, turn lane slash crown lane in this region is going to be cho um, finding my red center line for my road. And I'm going to do that for my eastbound, but then if that's the starting point for my westbound, what I'm then going to be looking for for my westbound turn lane slash crown is my actual westbound alignment. And the profile is not necessary in this particular case, but I think we can, we can go ahead and run that too. Yeah, let's, let's do that.
westbound, westbound, westbound FG. There we go. All right, that's looking a lot better, except uh, this is not gonna be the only region for my whole corridor. In fact, this is only gonna be valid until I get to my curb islands, because, well, then I'm gonna have other stuff to deal with. So I'm gonna just go ahead and snap to that edge of my curb line. Now I'm up in Minnesota, so we have a lot of snow plows. Uh, most of our curbs end in a square taper section with a nice shallow ramp so the plows uh, don't crash or break something. Um, if their uh, heights aren't quite right as they get into those areas. So cool, no median, no problem. Let's get into the heart of the matter. So for the same situation, I'm gonna have pretty much everything I had in my no median scenario. I'm going to have my primary eastbound travel lane and my primary westbound travel lane, but I actually don't need multiple regions to handle my left turn lane because what I'm gonna do I'll just copy this and delete my most of my westbound half is I'm going to keep this little tiny lane here and I'm going to make it even tinier. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time in school, um, you know, high school, college, associates, bachelors, whatever. We spend a lot of time in school with our science teachers hammering home this concept of significant figures. You know, it matters if it's a hundredth or a tenth or a thousand. Well, sorry, Mr. Yost, but I'm going to say I don't really care about the value of a tenth. I don't really care about the value of a hundredth. Um, in my overall design scenario here, and I'll just, I'll give it 0.01. We'll make this a hundredth. Um, I don't really care if this builds a little bit. What I do care, though, is that I have something that exists so that I can continue to target this yellow polyline. And as my turn lane advances and gets farther away, then I can use this tiny little sliver of a lane to hang on to that target, and I can now keep this all in the same region. And in the areas where I'm adjacent to my curb, throwing in an extra hundredth of a foot of pavement over here is not going to break my model, and it's going to save me a lot of headaches from making a bunch of different regions in my design. So that is in there, and I can, I guess I can make that back to a tenth, just so that it's somewhat easier to see and, and find. Now I'm going to attach my curb. So we'll just mirror that. And I suppose we can name this uh, EB curb outer. This is going to be my EB curb inner. And now what I need to do is I need to shoot from my top back of curb on my eastbound or my southern traffic area, and I need to go find something else that I know exists. Uh, I can't just rely on a distance. I need a vertical target for this too. Well, that's going to be our westbound alignment and finish grade profile. Okay. Well, how are we going to find that? I propose we use the out of the box link width and slope. Um, and yes, there is a CTC link width and slope, but that one has a depth and we want this thing to be as minimally profiled, as minimally intrusive as possible. So from here, I'm going to go to my out of the box subassemblies and I'm going to go find the generic link width and slope. Now, again, this is going to target something else. So I don't really care how wide it is. I don't really care how, what its slope is. I just need it to be visually getting everything else out of my way. So what this is going to do is it's going to go find my eastbound alignment. Well, what is that physically? Let's look at our westbound alignment. That's my baseline for my corridor, and it's effectively the uh, flange line or my edge of travel way off my lane on the west side. So let's go ahead and set that up as how that's going to be on the east side. So I need a lane to the outside. No big deal. We'll just take our existing eastbound lane, mirror that, copy my daylights, or sorry, mirror my curb and daylight on the outside. But this is exactly the heart of my problem. On my eastbound side, I know I'm going to hit my tie-in point. On my westbound side, I know I'm going to hit my tie-in point. But 
my top back of curb is really fundamentally related to my eastbound. How am I going to get all this stuff in the middle to tie back? Well, we're going to make a mess of the fundamental principles of working with corridors. And what we're going to do is we're going to ignore some warnings. So what I need is I need a, uh, another tiny little sliver of a lane and I need a curb, but I need them to point to the right. So when I look at my curb here uh, on the left side of my baseline, I can see that the side in my properties palette is listed as left. So too as the side being listed for my drive lane. And what that means is uh, as I build a part of, as part of my corridor, I am building the left or right of my baseline. I want to build to the right from this point though. No new baseline, no offset assembly, just build to the right. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my little tiny sliver that's currently on the left and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mirror this. I'm gonna mirror it to its same attachment point on the outside and it's gonna say, whoa, are you sure you wanna mirror it to the same side? Absolutely. Because now when I grab the subassembly, it says that its attachment side is on the right, which means that by the time my assembly gets to building this little piece here, it's going to start by being assigned to this point, and now it's going to build to the right. It's going to build to the inside, not to the outside of my subassembly. We can go ahead and we can run the same thing on our curb. And again, we'll confirm that that is in fact on the right side. And that's great, except I still have nothing to get me back to my primary design area. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and build the new region, uh, get some targeting put in, and then we'll see how the link to mark point functions. Uh, go ahead and do some um, renaming and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions yet. It's going to take me a minute to catch up here through my assembly, so feel free to roll those in and I can answer those while this is happening. For some reason this little sliver doesn't like to get an object selection or a whole, whole object selection. Uh, that is westbound inner, westbound outer, westbound gate. Also for those that came in a little late, we will be taking the full hour today. Uh, this is a moderately complex topic, uh, so I want to make sure we give that justice. So go select my corridor, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a region. And I'm going to do it, um, for, for starters here, we're just going to run it in the full width area of my corridor. So my region is going to be that. My assembly is going to be the one I forgot to rename. So again, housekeeping, it matters. Uh, this is going to be median L2MP, or medium OTB, that stands for out of the box, L2MP for link to mark point. Um, by giving a categorical name, by giving something that's intuitive, uh, it's going to make it so that I don't have to keep uh, entering and exiting out of corridors, or out of dialog boxes. And corridors, as we know, are very dialogue heavy. Now I can choose my median out of the box link to mark point. Alternatively, I could simply use my little green pick cube and grab the one that I am most interested in. And again, we're going to come through here and uh, I'll zoom out just a hair for visual purposes for that target. So editing my targets, new region. All right, surfaces, we're going EG. Eastbound lane, polyline to the south. Westbound lane, cyan polyline to the north. Eastbound turn crown. So this one is going to be, it's also my turn lane. And since I have my median, I don't really care about my center line or my crown line anymore. So this is actually going to be the polyline representation of my curb horizontally. Uh, since it's just a polyline, I don't have anything to worry about its, uh, its vertical values. 
my assembly, my typical cross section, is going to control that. And just like my westbound turn slash crown is going to be managed, uh, my eastbound is going to be managed by the curb polyline, so too will my westbound. The last thing that we're going to need to make this work is to make sure that our westbound lane, the inside of that, starts at the correct vertical and horizontal position. Uh, since everybody's muted, um, this isn't as interactive as I'd like, but um, what are we going to use for that target object if I need both vertical and horizontal targeting? Exactly, we're going to use an alignment and we're going to use our westbound alignment and design profile. Uh, now, technically, I should have, uh, I'm not following my own advice, I should have renamed this link width and slope uh, sub assembly. So uh, we can come back and do that in a minute. Oh, and uh, looks like Civil 3D is making a right mess of all of my um, codes and my feature lines. So we'll just have to deal with that for now and see if we can't come back to that later. Also, uh, since we're adding a whole new set of curbs um, on either side, it, it makes sense that those are jumping around a little bit. Uh, also, I'm just going to, again, value of 100. For the purposes of my model, if I just back these things away a little bit from each other, um, that can solve a lot of my problems um, so that I'm not overlapping and having things run across. Uh, and I can certainly solve that gap in my surface in other ways. So let's take a, a real quick look in here at my section editor. I'm going to pop in, just grab that one right next to the end, and let's confirm that we're doing everything reasonably correctly. So on the, on the east side of my road, I have my um, little sliver, not doing anything because I'm not in my turn lane. And as I come over, all right, um, 35 foot offset, center line, okay, not too bad. This is a really wide road. I've got a daylight on the side. And then again, um, I've got a marker popping up for my westbound road. So this looks pretty good. And I do technically have um, this purple line in here. That's a link. Well, let's go check out our uh, assembly and see what's going on here. So this link width and slope that we had put in is um, has a code and that code is top and it's datum. So if I were to try and build a surface from this right now, I'm not gonna work out too well because I, I don't really want this for part of my surface. But I've got two options here. First, I could just omit the link and that's gonna say, okay, well, we're not gonna use you for anything else anymore other than the uh, other targeting and the other sub assemblies that you're attached to, but you won't turn into a surface. You won't get sampled in your cross sections. I don't really like that though, because it makes it really hard to find this later. So my preferred method is to not omit the link because we still want to see it, but we can go into our code sets, which if you've been tuning into these webinars the last couple of months, you'll know is not that hard. We can go in, find our code set, and then under the link, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this one called no plot or NPLT for short. And this one's very simple. It is simply, um, It'll show up in model view, it'll show up in section view, uh, but it's gonna have like a really dark, unobtrusive color. And if you wanted to be super thorough, you could also throw it on a no plot layer. But I still wanna see it in my cross section, which is technically a different code set. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this link code to NPLT. I'm going to rebuild my corridor. And now down here in my cross section, uh, yeah, I can still technically see that um, design one, but it's, it's very unobtrusive and it's not gonna bother me. So let's create a top link now that will connect back and it will give me something that I can work with in my corridor. And this is where the link to mark point functionality comes in. So if you were here for the beginning, I mentioned that there's something very, very important about our order of operations between this mark point subassembly and our link to mark point. Very good. Uh, we need to put down our mark point first. So we need to have a checkpoint, or for anyone who's watched uh, too many military movies, you gotta paint the target. 
So where we want to connect to is our top back of curb from our uh, primary design side. And once I pop that down, this mark point, it's literally just a point inside your code set or inside your assembly. There's, there's no link, there's no connection. So we've got two fields in here. First is the point code. Now this is just like everything else in the code set. Do I get a feature line? Am I gonna display a marker? Uh, am I gonna trigger a label and cross section? Um, so this is not unimportant, but it's less important. The really big deal here is what is our point name? This is what our link to mark point is gonna come back to. So we want to, again, be thorough, be descriptive, um, have good housekeeping. So what this is, is this is my medium. And then a dash MP for mark point for good measure. Now the easiest way to make sure that you can get this kicked into your link to mark point is to simply do a clipboard copy. So I'm gonna control C that. Uh, take a screenshot, jot it down on a piece of paper, whatever. Um, and now with my out of the box subassemblies, the CPP does not recreate these. There was no need. So you gotta switch to your out of the boxes. But in here, I can now go and find my link to mark point. Now to the best of my knowledge and the knowledge of my team, uh, there, we, we have not been able to find a difference between the standard and the two version of these. So pick your poison. I don't like the two, so I'm, or I don't like seeing the number two, so I'm simply gonna pick the link to mark point one. Also, um, yes, we are technically working from left to right with this link, but just note that if uh, this link were on the right side of my subassembly, it would be still pointing in this right direction. Uh, my first and second circle would always be to the right of my insertion point. Don't ask me why, I don't know. Um, but for this one, again, we have link codes. These do matter because we do want this to be part of our surface. We do want this to be part of our cross sections. Um, and then my mark point name, this is that same checkpoint that I have to go back to. So whatever the, the name of my mark point was, the linked mark point needs to have that same one. That's the only way they're gonna find each other. So I'll press enter, I'll press escape. And now I'm also gonna check my code set. Oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Might come back, might not. Uh, and we'll rebuild our corridor and see what we get inside section editor. And now I can see that, that line being shown there. Now I do have a, uh, a link code in my code set that I cooked up here. It's called L2MP and it's got a width and slope label on it. So let's go ahead and add that L2MP code to our link. Okay, sensitive, no spaces. Got to rebuild the corridor if you want those new things to show up. Oh, perfect. And now I can see that at this specific point in my corridor, I'm 11.3 feet wide and I'm at a 0.2% slope. To see if we did this right with all of our targeting, we can now close out of section editor, grab this region and drag it forward to about the end of our curb. Uh, I did not. Technically, there's there's two independent polylines over here, so um, that's why that looked a little funny for a second. But now, this is where kind of the rubber hits the road. So let's go back into section editor near this area. I do not like that viewport configuration. I thought I'd change this. Plan up three above. Uh, left is section, not, no, let's do section on top. Plan left, assembly right. Because this is a really wide, a really wide roadway. So as I page through this corridor here, we'll see how this median begins to float. I'm getting shorter and my slope is getting steeper. I went from 2.5 feet and now I'm at a 7% cross slope. I'm at a 15% cross slope. Ugh, now these curbs are starting to back up on each other. That's a little too narrow. Maybe I need to widen those out. 
But either way, now I've got this varying width, varying slope section in my corridor, and things are looking great. So, um, you know, that's the power of this workflow when we're using the link to mark point. Um, so if you've stuck around this long, you've learned everything you need to learn about the basics for this workflow to work. For the rest, uh, for another 10 or so minutes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check out some of the ways that the corridor productivity pack can make this uh, design function a little bit more cleanly for our, uh, for our workflows here. So all I'm gonna do for the uh, other iterations of this, so I'm just gonna copy this main assembly. I'm gonna delete my old generic link to mark point subassembly. And then now I'm gonna go to my CTC corridor productivity pack subassemblies. We'll just keep this out, unhide. Go away layer manager, I don't care. Not right now. Make it all a little smaller. And let's look at some of these other ones. So I do have a, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. CTC did not recreate the marked point. They did come up with a few new subassemblies for the link to mark point. So we've got the generic link to mark point. We have the multi-layer lane to mark point. So what these subassemblies are gonna do, and I'll just throw these in detached. We don't need them on our uh, assembly yet. Is they're gonna do everything the out of the box link to mark point does, except they're gonna do it with shapes. So our out of the box or our, our basic CTC link to mark point is gonna be one shape. Uh, so we can customize the top link code, the bottom link code, all the point codes, and even the shape code. So this could be a layer of concrete, this could be a grassy sod layer, some sort of geomembrane, riprap, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, customize that to your heart's content. And this other one is the multi-layer lane link to mark point. So this is if you need a layer sandwich of your different shapes. Again, these codes are all customizable, so you don't have to use pavement codes. You could come up with that layer of riprap underlain by a geomembrane, underlain by some compacted clay. Um, sounds a lot like I was just describing a landfill, um, which you could do if you needed to have that link to mark point. So by customizing these shapes, by customizing these codes, we get better representation in our section views, and we get better quantification uh, should we so desire. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna use the generic um, CTC link to mark point because uh, I wanna show off, there is a median assembly, uh, sub assembly, but we gotta, we gotta be careful with that one for this particular design scenario. Uh, also gonna, nah, yeah, drop out a section editor. Also, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so I'm either doing a fantastic job or you people uh, you wonderful, wonderful attendees, you are maybe either confused or not. So feel free, get those questions in. I would love to answer them if, uh, if there's anything that you're unsure about with this workflow. So again, I have my link to mark point already, right? That's in, check. I need to copy that name and I need to assign it to my other subassembly. So my name of mark point, this is the one that I'm going to paste that in. Ah, don't drag a grip. Paste, enter. And there's another way that we can check that, right? So let's go in, uh, let's go into our uh, assembly properties. And the nice thing about our uh, assembly properties is that this is going to list us, you know, uh, what is my uh, assembly group? So that's right or left in this case. Um, every time you attach a sub assembly to your uh, assembly, um, it's going to create a new baseline, or it's gonna create a new group for your subassembly. Um, and then it's just gonna default those left, right, center, um, depending. And then what I'm looking for in here is I wanna make sure that my mark point is first, and then my link to mark point is somewhere underneath that. Right now, that condition is satisfied. So this should work when we go through and rebuild our corridor, which we will do now. One more time for good measure, and then let's pop into section editor as well. Oh, 
what I did not do is I did not change my assembly for that region. Um, or rather, I did not use that all on a new assembly. So we're going to cheat. I don't want to retarget all of that. It's not what you all signed up for. I'm simply going to copy this appropriately set up one over to my existing assembly and confirm. It should be, but we always want to be deliberate and confirm the order of my mark and link to mark points, which is a go. Rebuild. Section editor. All right, and now I can see I have this big white bar, which again is saying that I have something here. My code set does not know what it is, um, but that's not too hard. I can simply grab that uh, link to mark point, subassembly, and see that my shape is a sod. Go check my code set. Hmm, I don't have a sod. Let's add that. Uh, I have a shape style for sod but not the code. And that's in lower, capital S, lowercase OD. Okay. Rebuild. Hmm. It's got an ANSI 131 hatch, but whatever it was, it just responded. So again, this is the flexibility of custom subassemblies. We get to define our shapes, we get to define our codes, and when we have flexibility over our codes, our plan sets are putty within our hands at least as CAD managers and as power users too. So again, the CTC multi-layer lane to mark point is gonna work exactly the same way as this basic link to mark point. Another sub-assembly that I wanna show you is this CTC median sub-assembly. Um, and the really cool thing about this is once it passes a certain threshold of a width between the back of my, um, my close curb and the back of my far curb, is it's gonna switch between having a pavement link, or not, it's not the pavement link that's gonna change, but all this stuff down here on the bottom, right now I'm using a common base material and a common sub base material. If I change this value, we'll just call that 10 feet. Now it's going to have the intelligence to split this up into two independent curb segments. Um, and we're not gonna to have to excavate and have this all be common excavation and common refill. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead here for the last part. Uh, and I'm just gonna even fully switch over to a different file where I've already gone through this. Um, this took me a long time to get set up earlier today, uh, but I will simply show you the, the end result of all of this. So the problem with our very specific design scenario here today was that we wanted to have a single subassembly manage the transition between not having a turn lane and getting wider to follow that turn lane. Then whenever that got finished, we needed to jump ahead to our, um, to our other known point, horizontally and vertically, the alignment and profile, and then kind of build backwards a little bit. But with, again, this very specific workflow of having that sliver in there doesn't really work. If you can go, if you don't have a, a turn lane transition, you can use this subassembly and you can target, um, you can run that target. And let me just go ahead and prove that to you. I'll go into my corridor properties. Uh, technically this is a separate corridor, but I'll go into my target dialog and my horizontal outside curb and my vertical outside curb, whatever the outside one is, I have the ability to target that. Um, but since I needed, in this case, I, I needed a little sliver to go in there, the, the subassembly, it won't backtrack all the way. So what I had to do was, I'll just turn that one off. So this is a corridor with a region and the assembly for this region is pretty much everything but the curb. So my eastbound, has the primary lane and the sliver. We're gonna zip over to the other side. And yes, my link width and slope is going to the transition between my sliver and the primary drive lane. The sliver is has already been mirrored and it's on the 
quote unquote wrong side of the assembly because we wanted to build the other way. And then other than that, it's completely the same as this link to mark point stuff I did earlier. But this link width and slope shape, uh, it's not omitted, but I have set it to that no plot. That's why we don't see any frequency lines going across this area for my median. From here, I, you know, I, I don't have an alignment profile. I can't like hand sketch that. But what I do have is I have a set of feature lines and I can extract feature lines from my corridor. All these uh, different points throughout here created a feature line. Um, and I did do one other, one other custom thing that's different from the other ones. I added in a random or added in a specific mark point at the edge of both of my slivers. And what this does is it gives me the opportunity to create a custom point code. This custom point code can then go into our code set and be used to generate a feature line for us. So with this, I've got a point, I've got CFLL, CFLR. So that's custom feature line left and right. With this, I select my corridor. I can now extract those custom feature lines out of there and with those feature lines extracted, I can use those as both baselines and targets for other corridors. What I cannot do is I cannot extract a feature line out of a corridor and then use that as a, as a target within the same corridor. Because otherwise you just have a circular reference and if there's one thing computers hate, it's circular logic and circular references. So technically to get this to work, I did have to create a second independent corridor just for my median to fill on top. And again, I chose a very specific design example. You don't have to do this all the time. Um, you can simply, you know, if you have one alignment profile, you can just run this all the way across if you want to. So I will re-engage um, my median. It's gonna start rebuilding. And now if I were to take myself into section editor, That's not gonna work for both of those at the same time. Let me get a sample line in here real quick. Eastbound. Hundred feet on either side. Almost done. I will not go over my hour unless you have extra questions. Uh, give me a section view. All right, so we can see that as I am in a situation where my curb is very close together, uh, again, I've got that common base, common excavation area. And as I get out to the section where my turn lane is no more, we can see that my this median subassembly has already determined, hey, these curbs are far enough apart, we don't have to excavate all the way down. So uh, I had to create a second media, a second corridor here because I was trying to use a, an extracted feature line, both as the result of my first corridor and as an and as a as data for further feedback that creates an uh, an impossible loop for the software. So I did have to create a second soft or a second corridor for my median. This does provide an interesting uh, example though for, for some of the nuances of corridor design. I mentioned at the beginning, corridors always build perpendicular to their baseline. So in this case, because I was using my extracted corridor feature line to the north associated with my westbound travel lane, uh, we can see that there's areas where these frequency lines don't quite line up. Well, that's because I'm following this path and I have to build perpendicular to it. And so that's why that was all happening. Um, so creating different baselines, possibly creating different corridors might be necessary in order to get your, um, your model to build super correctly. Now, this is my final act in Civil 3D. I'm just gonna save and I'm gonna attempt to see what this looks like inside Object Viewer, which may prompt a crash when I run my ISO corner. And I mean, all in all, this actually does look pretty good, even though 
Uh, technically, some of those corners were not quite uh, in the same alignment, but you know, overall this looks okay. If you have a really extreme bend in your curve, consider creating that as a new baseline as a new cross section, because otherwise it will look really goofy. All right, thank you so much for sticking with me through that folks. Let's go ahead, let's wrap this up and uh, take us into the conclusion. So what did we learn today? Well, we learned that the link to mark point workflows give us even more flexibility in our corridor designs. They give us so much flexibility, they even let us forget about some of that fundamental behavior for corridors. So we don't always have to build perpendicular to and away from our baselines. Sometimes we can build back in toward it, as long as we remember a few of those tricks. Also, using the corridor productivity pack from CTC software, using those subassemblies, it gives our users robust link to mark point subassemblies with multiple shapes so that we can have better section display and better QTO at the end stages of our projects. Lastly, our CPP subassemblies are just more flexible than the out of the box ones. You can still edit these source files in subassembly composer if you want to in order to further suit your needs. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and show off. I did have subassembly composer open. Uh, this is probably our most complicated one. This is the, uh, the min dot curb with sidewalk primary advantage of this one is that this shape 34 has a uh, it's a common fill area so that means that we can now quantify what we have to dig out and put back in but putting this together overall is just a this took my coworker Scott Mizak a very long time to build you don't have to become a subassembly composer master in order to gain all the benefits of subassembly composer. If you want to download these, go ahead and head over to the CTC software website, ctcsoftware.com, products tab on the ribbon, go find the corridor productivity pack. We've got a little demo video, a couple of bullet points and screenshots of what these look like. A lot of these have a help file. And then to download it, simply run this download for free. It's going to capture your information. Um, and then you'll get to use these. Uh, find your PKTs, right click on your tool palette tab and import the subassemblies by pointing to those PKTs. And with that, I wanna say thank you very much for your time today.